Hi, welcome everyone. We'll get started with the webinar in, in just uh, a minute or so. Welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr. I'm with Octo, Open Communications for the Ocean. I'm Chief Knowledge Broker here at Octo. Um, and we're very pleased that you could all join us today for today's webinar on the 30 by 30 progress tractor, scenarios and visualization for achieving 30 by 30 goals. And we're especially pleased to have our presenters today, Michelle Delion and Jason Seipel of Sky Truth. And we also have Shyla Huck and Eric Teller of Sky Truth, who will be um, joining us as panelists who may be answering some questions in the chat and in the question panel. Before we get started, and I turn it over to Michelle and Jason, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions during the webinar. So you're welcome to ask questions throughout the webinar or put in comments relevant to the topic. Um, you can do that through the chat. Um, you have the options of sending chats to everyone in who is attending or just the host and panelist or to, to um, just to me. Um, and you also have the option to put questions into the question panel. Uh, the question panel is a little easier for us to moderate, but we'd also try and keep up with any questions uh, put into the chat as well to, to ask those to the presenters. So we'll have about 30 to 40 minutes of presentation first, and then we'll move to a dedicated time for question and answers. But as I said earlier, you can put in your questions and thoughts at any point. Um, since the chat is enabled for everyone to share information, um, we ask you are able to share relevant information to the topic with everyone. You can share experiences, other resources that are useful, uh, but just please keep um, the information shared on the topic and professional. Um, someone just asked if we'll be sharing the presentation after the call. We will, uh, a lot of this present, the presentation today will be live demonstration. So the recording of today's webinar will be most useful and it will be available on the Octo website under the webinars panel um, later today. Uh, and I'll put in a web link that you can go to uh, for that into the chat in just a minute. So um, thank you again to Michelle and Jason uh, for being here, and I'll turn it over to you guys now. Thanks, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Michelle Dalian. I'm the Chief Impact Officer of SkyTruth, and as Sarah noted, I'm joined by my colleague Jason Seipel, who serves as the product lead for our 30 by 30 progress tracker. So for today's webinar, we'll be providing an overview of our 30 by 30 progress tracker. But before we get into that, I'll provide a high-level overview of SkyTruth, as well as why we decided to build this tool. So a little bit about SkyTruth. SkyTruth is a nonprofit organization based in the United States. We were founded in 2001 uh, by John Amos, and we specialize in harnessing Earth observation data and other geospatial data to make hidden environmental issues visible and measurable, as well as actionable. Um, we believe that making hidden environmental issues visible is the first step to solving them. Um, over the past two decades since our founding, we've tackled some of the most important challenges around the world, ranging from illegal fishing. In 2016, we founded Global Fishing Watch in partnership with Google and Oceana. And most recently, we launched a project called Cerulean to track uh, chronic oil pollution in the world's oceans. At SkyTruth, we're committed to building transparency on important conservation challenges around the world. One of those important, important, important conservation challenges that we've identified is the Global Biodiversity Framework's 30 by 30 target. Near, nearly 200 countries committed to protecting 30% of Earth's lands and waters in, in 2022 by 2030. Um, unfortunately, we're lagging behind on marine protection at 8% reported by countries. So we decided to iterate on a 30 by 30 pup progress tracker to create an entry point for the public to better understand progress on 30 by 30, as well as the effectiveness and equity of area-based conservation measures. 
In partnership with the Bloomberg Ocean Initiative, we launched the 30 by 30 progress tracker um, early this year at the Our Ocean Conference to serve as an entry point to better understand our progress towards 30 by 30. As Jason will highlight later on, uh, the 30 by 30 progress tracker has three components. The first component is the overall progress tracker using country reported data. And then we also have a conservation builder, a light conservation builder to better understand what are the different scenarios to achieve 30 by 30. And lastly, we have a high level knowledge hub to better understand the landscape of resources to more deeply understand 30 by 30. And as we've noted here, um, one of the goals for the 30 by 30 progress tracker is to serve as an entry point for myriad data on area-based conservation measures to better understand effectiveness and also uh, equity on area-based conservation measures around the world. Um, we're bringing in country reported data as well as independent evaluations of 30 by 30. As I noted earlier this year, we launched the marine component of the 30 by 30 progress tracker. We're currently undergoing user testing and platform updates, so we're eager to receive your feedback after this presentation. And later this year, we'll be expanding the 30 by 30 progress tracker to include terrestrial. So I'll hand it over to my, Jason, my, my colleague, Jason Seipel. Uh, to provide a quick demonstration of our 30 by 30 progress tracker. Great, thanks, Michelle. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. As Michelle mentioned, my name is Jason Seipel. I lead an independent consulting firm called An Ocean Advocate, and I'm super excited to be partnering with SkyTruth as the product lead for our 30 by 30 progress tracker. So during this demo today, I'm going to run through an example scenario of how a member of civil society from Panama might use the tracker. But this scenario could easily apply to many other use cases, many other user groups. Um, so it's very scalable. And so I'll begin by kind of going through the progress tracker and showing how you can monitor and look at marine conservation details at the global, then regional, then country level. Next, I'll move on and show the conservation builder where we can see pathways to potentially achieving 30 by 30 goals. And then finally, I'll show the knowledge hub where it's an easy way to find more information to get more depth of details around 30 by 30. Uh, throughout, we have a lot of enhancements on the marine side, and we are planning on expanding in terrestrial this year. So at various points through the demonstration, I'll kind of explain different areas where we're going to have those enhancements coming very soon. So. Right. So... The 30 by 30 progress tracker is freely available and you can go to 30 by 30.skytruth.org in order to access it. So on your landing experience, we provide a lot of content around what the platform is built for, its purpose, background information on what 30 by 30 is, and various other details to help people orient themselves with these concepts and why biodiversity is important. So we really wanna make sure that people understand coming here, if they don't have any background, they can at least get a little high level overview and also links to where they can do deeper dives. Beyond there, you can go to the About page, where there's even more content and more information supporting getting oriented with 30 by 30, and also an overview of some of the great data partners and um, groups that we're working with. But today, I really want to focus on the Conservation Builder uh, Knowledge Hub and Progress Tracker. So as someone coming to the platform the first time, I probably would start in the Progress Tracker, where I'm looking to get a quick, easy to understand overview of where we are today with marine conservation. So information is gonna be presented to you in two different ways. First, visually in a map where you can easily see um, the location of current marine protected areas and other effective area-based conservation measures. So you can see where they're located uh, globally. And then we also have a dashboard that's highlighting some key indicators, uh, sourcing information from a lot of great um, partners in order to really give a snapshot of where we are today. So kind of walking through the dashboard right now, I can quickly see uh, the top number is what is reported today. So coming from protected planet, what percent of the ocean is reported as protected? So we can see that 7.9% of the ocean is protected at this point in time based on what has been fed into the WDPA, the World Database on Protected Areas. We can also see historical trends. So how has that changed over time up until the current year? 
And then based on extrapolating forward using the exact same rate of implementation, we can kind of project where we think we'll be by 2030. So we can see that based on the current rate of implementation, we're going to fall well short of our goal of 30% by 2030. So we really need to see an uptick in the expedited implementation of protected areas. But beyond, although this is very important information to understand around what is reported as being out there, it's also important to understand what's the management effectiveness and what's been independently verified as really implemented and providing the conservation benefits that we really need these protections to do. So we have integrated some information, some indicators from some of our partners. This first one is from Marine Protection or MP Atlas, and it's based on their analysis of the top 100 uh, protected areas in place. And they've gone through and did a very rigorous methodology to assess has it been implemented and what level of protection is it really providing based on the MPA guide uh, methodology. So we can see based on their um, great work that we can see 2.8% approximately is fully highly protected and implemented globally. Another enhancement that we're looking to implement very soon is from our partners, Protected Seas. We're gonna have a qualitative independent assessment around fishing protection levels. So we'll have an indicator showing globally how much of the ocean is actually highly protected from fishing. So we're very excited to be incorporating that soon. As I move down, we know that certain habitats are very important for, cons or for um, biodiversity. So we want to have the ability to quickly show some of these key habitats and what percentage of those habitats are actually falling within reported protected areas. So you can see that mangroves, currently 41.6% of global mangroves are falling within protected and conserved areas, 12.7 seamounts and so forth. So as I mentioned, um, I'm from Panama, so really love seeing what's at the global level, but I might be more interested in how we're doing regionally. So I can quickly change the focus to my region of interest. So I can look at Latin America and the Caribbean, and you'll see that the entire map and also dashboard is quickly updated and filtered to focus just on that area that I'm interested in. So now I'm seeing the metrics, all the same information, but specifically for my region where I wanna do a deeper dive on the analysis. So I can see that at a reported level, we're actually trending ahead of, of the global uh, values. Um, but from an independently assessed level, we're actually slightly behind. Um, and so there's a lot of great information here, but I also wanna see how are, is my country performing compared to other countries in, in my region. So I can click on a more details tab where you're now presented with a tabular view of key metrics by country. And this is something that I can quickly sort so if I wanna look at how are we ranking compared to others as far as what's been reported to protected planet, I can do the coverage and I can see Argentina is leading the way um, in the region, 46.6% reported as protected. But Panama, I can see that, you know, we're doing pretty well. And assuming we have a goal of 30%, you know, it seems we're getting very close. I can also sort based on the MP Atlas, if I wanna look at this independent assessment, um, what's been verified as implemented and fully highly protected, I can also sort on that column to see, okay, what is the ranking based on that assessment? And I see Panama now, we are at the top of that list. Just to take one step back to show you some additional contextual layers before I dive deeper into the Panama side. As you're looking through this information, you might be interested in seeing some of it displayed on the map as well. So we have a layer section where there's a lot of great context that actually adds visually some more information that makes it easier to interpret. So if I want to understand this 2.8%, how does that actually show up on the map? You can easily turn on the protection level. And now you'll see the designation of where the highly and fully protected areas are versus those with minimal or unknown um, assessments. Similar when I'm looking at the various conservation around habitats, um, we have the habitat layers so you can turn on and off and see those locations and where they intersect with the protections in place. So I can look at the cold water, sea grasses, sea mounts. Some of these other layers I'll talk about in a little more detail when I get to the conservation builder. But jumping back to my example of looking specifically at Panama. So now I'm easily to quickly focus in on my area of interest. So, you know, I've seen globally how we're performing. I've seen regionally how um, the region that I live in is working. And also I was able to kind of compare country by country where we're positioned. But now I really want to dive deeper specifically for Panama because I want to see what would it take us to get to our goal? Assuming we want to have 30% by 2030, what do we need to do in order to get there? And then where can I find more information to become involved? So right now I can see 
we are getting pretty close, but if I go to the conservation builder, I can actually now start to interact with the map. So it's a very lightweight modeling tool. Um, by no means it wouldn't be the end where you would draw a, a proposed area here and we'd expect that it would be implemented. It's more of a way for making it easier for people to understand what areas should ideally be looked at for potential protection. What does it actually mean? How much area does it take to get us to where we need to be? So just getting information to people's hands so they become more informed advocates for marine protection so that they understand and can make decisions and really find ways to become involved. But right now at the default view for the map, you know, I can see where the exclusive economic zone, the territory waters for Panama are. I can see the existing protected areas, but I really don't know which part of the ocean I should target to protect. So at this point, I'd wanna turn on some more contextual layers to help guide my decisions around areas to propose this protection. So I could start to turn on some of the key habitats to see if there's any specific areas that may be of interest that we should consider protecting. I know that seamounts, for example, are very important for biodiversity. So I'd like to understand where the seamount locations are. But this alone isn't enough to really make me confident in proposing an area. So we actually have some research-based recommendations that come from various published reports and experts based on scientific methodologies that have proposed what areas they think should be protected. So for example, we have a report from Pew, which focuses on the high seas, so up 30% of the ocean they feel based on various variables and factors should be protected. But since I'm talking about Panama and my specific economic exclusive zone, I, I wanna focus on that. So we have two other papers, one from uh, Zal et al, which recommends 30% of the ocean based on various variables. And then also another report by Sala et al. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn this one as well. So now I can also see based on expert scientific recommendations that balances climate change, biodiversity, socioeconomic factors, what areas do they think should be protected? And I quickly see an area here that jumps out where it both has seamounts, it's been recommended by experts that should be protected. And it also could form some connectivity between some existing protected areas. So at this point, I can click on draw on the map and I can start to draw a proposed protected area. And it's gonna dynamically on the fly calculate how much additional area that proposed uh, protected area would add to our overall uh, protection for our country. And in this example, uh, my drawing was a little off, so I crossed the economic zone, so it actually shows the impact to Costa Rica as well if it was implemented. So it's an easy and quick way to understand how large of an area it would take to get us beyond that 30%. So I can see that if my proposed area was implemented, it would get us beyond that 30%. So now jumping back um, to specifically looking at what is actually out there, there's more information I can find here. So, you know, it's great. I have proposed an area. I think this would be an interesting place to implement, but maybe I want to look at what are the various protected areas that we already have in place and maybe some that are planned. So if I click on the more details for Panama, now I'm presented with information around what are the different protected areas and OECMs that are actually in place or planned. So if I want to look at, okay, what are our largest ones? I can see that we have several. It looks like there's a very large one that's still in a designated state. Um, then we see another large protected area that's fully, it has two zones, a fully protected area and a highly. So this is one that's driving a lot of our actual protection and also what's been verified as fully and highly protected. But I can see here that, you know, there is this additional marine protected area that is being designated, so it's in the works. And it's large enough that if it was actually implemented and it was maybe actually at a high protection level, it would get us well beyond our goal, assuming we were trying to get to 30% by 2030. So I'd really like to learn more about the background. What is this uh, marine protected area? Why is it still in a designated state? Maybe when is it planned to be implemented? Will it be before 2030? And if when it is implemented, is it going to be managed effectively so that it provides level of protection we need? So at this point, I can go to find more information by navigating to the Knowledge Hub. So when I go to the Knowledge Hub, um, before I kind of dive deeper into my interest to learn more about a specific protected area, there's a lot of great content here. And there's a lot of great, great partners out there, such as the High Ambition Coalition that have put together a very extensive 30 by 30 solutions toolkit, which has a lot of great information and background by 3030. So our goal in this case is, is not to replace our um, it's more to complement our partners and get people quickly to the sites where they can find a lot of great information. So if someone wanted to just learn more about 30 by 30, they can quickly link over and see 
the solutions toolkit and dig into the details here. But in my example, um, I want to learn more about that specific protected area in uh, Panama that is currently in the designation state. So I can filter just, I only want to look at assessments. So sites that have more information that go into detail around assessing uh, protected areas. So I see several great resources here to get more information. Um, the Protected Planet World Database on OECMs and World Database on Protected Areas, the MPA Guide, which gives background on how um, assessments for the level of protection can be understood in the methodology, Protect Seas Navigator, great information on level of fishing protection. But I'm going to go ahead and pick MP Atlas as a location to find more details. So at this point, I've quickly now branched away from you know, our starting point, which pulls together information to make it easier for people to understand, to somewhere I can dive deeper. So now I can search for that specific uh, Panama protected area, and immediately I can get to all the information I was looking for. I can dig into deeper in here around its current status, understand, okay, if it was implemented, it looks like it's minimally protected, and go down through and find a lot of great content around why it was assessed that way. So it's very seamless in how you can, at a very high level, get an overview of where we are today and an understanding of how we're progressing, look for opportunities around how to move the needle towards or the path to getting to progress um, to our goals, but also then how to go find more information. So if you want to learn a lot more, if you want to get more heavily involved, if you'll find organizations or if just more details, you can quickly go to the Knowledge Hub and find additional information. So I have already mentioned that as far as enhancements, uh, one thing that's coming very soon that I'm excited about is integrating protected seas, um, qualitative independent assessed information. So we get some of that more management effectiveness around um, protection levels. We're also soon gonna be rolling out versions right now. It's English only, but very soon we'll be supporting Spanish, we'll be supporting French. Uh, we also wanna start laying in important information around uh, socioeconomic IPLC and other data sources. So we are in works with Global Fishing Watch to integrate information around apparent fishing activity. So we can quickly see, you know, if we have an area that is protected, it's been assessed that it's fully highly protected, it has fishing protection levels um, indicated. We can then also see, is there actual fishing activity occurring? So getting that full transparency that although all the right checks and measures in place, it's been verified, there is some maybe illegal activity happening. Um, beyond that, our big push this year is to extend this. So right now, this is a marine focus. The goal is by October to have a terrestrial component as well. So we're currently actively designing how that'll look and feel, but it's going to be very similar to what you see here, uh, where you'll have information for terrestrial conservation and OECMs um, with historical trends, key habitats, coverage, um, details coming from our key partners, such as protected planets still, um, and also recommendations for in the conservation builder from others around what areas should be protected. So that is a high level overview of all the capabilities and current functionality, a lot more great things to come. Um, and Michelle, if you would like to show our contact information. Um, we're always open for feedback and you know we're building this as a solution to help kind of amplify we're integrating information from a lot of great sources our goal is to aggregate and make this freely available so it's transparency accountability but we're looking to amplify and extend the reach of our partners and also just make a simpler path for our customers and users to understand 30 by 30. Michelle, you're. If you had anything uh, else to say, you're you're muted right now. Nothing else to add on my end. Thanks, Jason. Um, we provide our contact information here. Um, we see a lot of great questions in the chat, so we're eager to get to them. Um, but if you'd like to reach out to us about any other suggestions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. This was a great overview, and we actually have plenty of time for questions, and we, which is good because we have plenty of questions. Okay, so I'll get started from some that came in early. And Eric, thank you so much for uh, and and Shyla for answering some, and then flagging uh, some for answering a lot. It's super helpful. Okay, so starting with this one. So the the anonymous attendee said, "Sorry if I missed this. With regard to the ocean, 
does the percentages of protected and desired to be protected areas only include national and state waters or also international waters? If international waters, how do we make lasting protections there? So we do include areas beyond national jurisdictions. So this is all um, marine environment. So it's not just territorial waters that can be attributed to a specific country, but also we have all information is available around the high seas as well. Um, great question on how do we actually achieve that? I mean, it's just going to take an international coalition agreements and cooperation and collaboration across all countries because no one has jurisdiction over the high seas. And it's not something that you know, one country can do alone. And the reality is the high seas is the majority of the ocean. So the only way to really truly achieve protection of 30% in the or greater and the protecting the right areas, it's going to need to include the high seas. So I know that having the BBNJ is a, a way, a great step in the right direction. Um, hopefully more and more countries will actually sign up and officially agree to it. But I think uh, it's going to take more of that kind of international collaboration to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Um, there was also the question, um, have you thought about how this tool could interact with the High Seas Treaty? Did you have anything else to say on this or is what you said previously pretty much cover? Yeah, that? I think the main thing is um, we're really building this tool as a solution to kind of help anyone and everyone um, to achieve. We're all kind of in the same reason, right? We want to protect our planet. We want to achieve these goals in order to um, offset climate change, protect biodiversity. So the high treaty, we'd love this tool to support all information available around that. We would integrate it here. It's a great place to just summarize it and make it easily understandable to everyone um, to help drive awareness and support for things like the high seas treaty. Thank you. Um, another um, response question. Thank you for your presentation. How are these contextual layers for the conservation building or builder selected? Are there social data considerations within these aggregates from Pew and others, for example, marine and coastal tenure? Are there plans to expand on these contextual layers in the tool? Uh, great question. Um, so how they were selected at first? So we had, um, with any new product, you kind of have the minimal scope. You have to minimize the scope because you have a limited timeline and you know, limited resources. So we tried to initially focus on identifying various um, source information that were available at a global scale, that were widely trusted, accurate, reliable, um, and also that would kind of lay the foundation for some of the key elements around what would be useful. Our goal is to absolutely expand this beyond these initial data sets, but we want to do it in a thoughtful way so that it doesn't become overwhelming um, or confusing or hard or difficult to use, because sometimes more information can actually lead to bad decisions if it's not integrated in a very thoughtful, user-friendly, usable way. But we absolutely are always looking to extend this. And one area we really want to do this is around um, socioeconomic components, also indigenous peoples and local communities who so are starting to make this more robust. Some of that information is included in those re, um, uh, expert research papers. That's why we really like those, because it's not just purely based on biodiversity benefits. It actually is layering in uh, food security, um, various other variables. So the links and the information can take you to those papers. We can see all the details that they've factored in considerations around this socioeconomic components as well. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, another question came in um, related to that. And so um, I'm excited about the conservation builder. Protected areas have a long history of displacing local and indigenous communities. Will there be an ability to see what the impact would be of future protected areas on these communities. Did did you have anything to add, Jason and Michelle, on this topic or sort of covered it with the last question with the last response? I think on that topic, um, there's a few thoughts around that. One is this is something we want to make freely and openly available to everyone. So on the conservation builder, we would hope that people could use it to kind of illustrate if they know a proposed area is being planned and they wanna draw it on and overlay and they understand the location of potential impact. It could be used as a way to facilitate the conversation and kind of drive that forward. Um, one thing we'd love to do is find some global information that would support that um, contextual layer around IPLC information. Um, to be honest, as of now, we have not found something that is robust at a global level that incorporates all of that. Um, so if someone's aware, absolutely would love that feedback and love to, 
um, include that information so that, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, we're not just protecting the planet, but we're doing it in an equitable, uh, effective way. So, and our goal is to make information transparent and available. So as that becomes available, we'll absolutely include it. Um, and also there might be a future use case to make this more tailored to regional and more local perspectives. It's just that initial scope and timeline, we really focus on that global perspective. And as of this point, we didn't have anything at a global level to include. Yeah, okay. yeah this oh, to add, add to that, um, our goal for the 30 by 30 progress tracker is really to build transparency on not just only the effectiveness of area-based conservation measures, but also the equity. So we're eager to learn more about additional data leaders that would be helpful to better understand the impacts of area-based conservation measures on indigenous peoples and local communities. Okay, thank you, Michelle and Jace. Jason. Um, let's see, another question, can you change the base map? Not in the current version. Um, there's definitely a lot of those kind of user experience enhancements that over time we'll need to prioritize against our various other backlog items. Um, but in this current version, uh, there is not that ability but absolutely love feedback and any way to make this more impactful, more user-friendly, um, we'd love to have that. And we do have a, a very long list of things we want to get to over time. It's just a matter of really prioritizing the work and focusing on what's most important up front. Okay, all right, let's see. Um, one challenge is the lag in reporting to WDPA by individual countries. For example, for Belize, percent protected is at 20.3%, but WDPA only shows 11.8%. Is this addressed in the Knowledge Hub and has there been any discussion on efforts to speed up reporting? That is a great point. And I'm a data person at heart for like my entire career. And you're always at the mercy of the accuracy of your information. It's gotta be accurate, reliable, timely. Um, so that's a process, right? And it's there's not one group that can really control that because we're at the not the mercy, but we're dependent on everyone actively providing information that's accurate, providing it very timely. And what we're hoping is that by exposing this information and showing a lot of these different great data sources side by side, we can highlight some of those challenges that are currently faced by our partners. The fact that maybe information isn't being provided in a timely or complete way. Um, as important as it is globally, it's really important that we all start to have those conversations and really try to push process improvements and get people to be kind of held accountable to share information more quickly. Because in order for to achieve these goals, we have to work together, you know, across all countries. And so, you know, we are in uh, close cooperation with our various partners, and I, I'm sure that's something they've been trying to struggle to solve for a long time. Um, but we absolutely want to try to amplify amplify that and help to kind of help push that forward. Okay, thank you so much, Jason. Um, two sort of related questions I'll read to you. So if you wanted to add anything in, in relation to your previous response in relation to these questions. Um, it said, great tool. Do you have any information published on how you calculate covered percent percentage? Also, how frequently are you pulling data from your partners to update the progress tracker? Um, and another related question was, how are you verifying and validating information? I see several areas I have firsthand knowledge of that are reported as um, actively managed and that is something of a stretch. Okay. Um, so on the first question, we do have methodologies that we'll be publishing. So that's one area that I think we, our focus has been on rolling out the platform. And the one thing we need to expand on is the documentation, which is gonna be coming very soon. And that'll include detailed methodology around how we're performing the calculations. In all situations, we try to replicate our data partners exactly. So we're not trying to produce any new information here. What we're trying to do is aggregate information from our partners and leverage their approaches and their great work, which is bringing it together in one place so you have a lot more um, information to understand by showing things side by side. In some cases where our methodology or our numbers don't 100% reconcile to our data partners, we have gone through and identified what is the cause of that? And when you're working with geospatial data, sometimes there could be timing differences on the um, the version of the marine boundaries and coastal boundaries differences. It can have minor um, discrepancies, but we've gone through, verified that our numbers are, if not exact, very close, and then we'll describe why they might be slightly off. Um, from an update timing perspective, our goal is to have this updated monthly. Um, certain partners' data might not update 
as frequent as them. It's just staying in close contact and making sure as um, new information is pushed out, we make sure to integrate that as quickly as possible. But there's always going to be the risk that there's a slight lag, but I wouldn't foresee more than a few days to a week lag. So information be, should be very timely. And on your last point around um, questionable information is available. Um, we are, again, not trying to replace or uh, replicate um, or redo what our partners done. We're kind of taking in the information. So if our information is incorrectly entered into the WDPA, that will just flow through. Um, so it's really at the mercy and dependency of people that are owning that data that actually are responsible for then providing it to make sure they provide it accurately. And there's actually, to be completely honest, it could be that we have a little bug that we just aren't aware of. So if you see something, absolutely share, reach out. You can reach out directly to me because we want the feedback and we will fix any issues and um, either chase them down with our partners or fix it on our end if it's something that's come up that's part of our platform. And okay. just to get back yeah, on, ahead, on the partner side, um, we have two key data partners on the independent evaluation side. As Jason has noted throughout the presentation, one of them is MPA Atlas under the Marine Conservation Institute and the other data partner is Protected Seas Navigator. Uh, both of these organizations have spent hundreds of hours, if not thousands of hours collectively, to evaluate area-based conservation measures. Uh, but each of these organizations have their own independent methodologies to better understand the effectiveness of area-based conservation measures. And both of their data sets are um, available on our platform. Okay. Right, thank you guys. Um... Let's see, it says, there's a question, understandably the tool uses global data sets, but often there is better, more accurate regional or, or local, shoot, um, try to get it back in the chat. Uh, regional or local data sets, um, such as cold water distribution, seamount, polygons, et cetera. Any plans to add functionality in the future to incorporate regional or local data sets? Yeah, we would absolutely love to scale to that type of use case where we could have um, versions of this that, you know, we have the global version that's used at a very high level, but also to take it to regional and even country specific if there is a partner that will want to work with us. Because you're absolutely right. Not all for information is collected consistently globally, and there might be certain areas or regions that have more um, detailed information. And this tool could be much more powerful if for specific use cases users, if we can kind of have a version that would support that more of a local or a regional scope. So I think right now, just because of wanting to get this launched and focusing it initially, just getting the foundational elements in place, um, we focus on that global level, but absolutely I think scaling and looking for ways to take it to that path, we would be open to. Great, thank you. Um, can you ex another question? Can you expand on the fishery closed areas? For example, looking at the US EEZ, there are many missing seasonal closed areas. So I think some of that information will probably come through. As I mentioned, one of the enhancements is coming soon is details around fishing protection levels coming from protected seas. So some of that detail might come from there. Um, but that's a great question. I, I think I would, if I can, I can take that offline, go back to the team and understand a little more around if we have integrated um, seasonal type closures. And if not, I can come back with if we have any plans or how we could approach that. Thank you. Um, let's see. So another question, great work and excellent product. Are you considering an option to tease out coastal areas and inland waters in future accounting? These tend to be bundled under marine and terrestrial areas, respectively, for 30 by 30 accounting. That is a great point. Um, and one that's also going to be a challenge for how we can do this in a thoughtful way um, based on the information available. So absolutely, as we pull in the terrestrial information, we we're kind of talking through this. And it's probably too early for us to talk through the design or how we're going to approach it. But it's something, a topic that we have discussed because... You can't really just think about marine alone. You can't think about terrestrial alone. There's coastal, there's so much watershed interactions that you, in an ideal world, you'd be managing all this collectively. And um, right now we're early on in the design thought around how do we handle the kind of coastal inland waters and interaction. Um, but that's definitely something to come and probably something we'll iterate over time to make it more effective and robust. And as for 
as we're expanding the product, we really encourage you all to reach out to us if you have any suggested features, especially on the terrestrial and inland waters component of this product. Um, this is a very iterative process for us for the balance of the year, and we really want to ensure that the community's feedback is incorporated in that process. Great. Thank you, Jason and Michelle. Um, let's see. Another question. Can the tool evaluate the percentage of hydrothermal vent systems conserved? Not at the moment, because we don't have it as a data set incorporated, but that's something of interest and the location of those are easily obtainable. Um, we could incorporate that easily and perform that calculation. For now, we had just, as I mentioned, you know, there was so many different ideas of uh, data sets to include and where we could take this. We tried to limit the scope, but if there are areas that we should incorporate that add a lot of value, um, such as the extended continental shelf is something that has been brought up and a population density. There's a lot of other factors and data sets we want to bring in. So absolutely, I think if that information is available, we could incorporate it. And if it's something valuable that we should prioritize ahead of other work, uh, we can definitely explore that. Okay, thank you. Um, question, probably a European-centric question, but the tool currently seems to highlight areas of high biodiversity. But there are areas that are globally important for specific species, such as UK um, and 90% of the global Manx shearwater population. Is there any ambition to incorporate this sort of information into the tool without making the whole map a blob of important areas? <laughs> yeah, that is the struggle, right? Um, so I think it kind of goes back to that um, localization or specialization of the tool and customizing it for different use cases. So there is, if there's a demand for that and a partner that would want to work with us and we wanted to explore doing something more regional. So if there's a Europe specific um, set of factors that should be considered, um, we could absolutely do that. But you're right, we, we were trying to avoid over-engineering this at the beginning by having way too many recommendations because you're right, you turn it all on and you just everything's highlighted. And the reality is that's not achievable or it's probably not our best path forward. So we tried to pick a representative set to start with that we thought would be a, a good cross-section of balancing biodiversity, socioeconomic and other factors, and also the high seas and um, ec exclusive economic zones. So get the right balance to start with. But we might find over time there's, there's better sources or better recommendations that people agree on that should be included. And it could be around specific um, species or other elements. So we would consider that. We just needed to kind of draw a line of where we we're going to start with. And we kind of landed on the set of data sets we've worked with. But again, like Michelle mentioned, and I've mentioned, we are absolutely looking for feedback and we would love to work with anyone to get how we can make this even better, more impactful. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, again, some of the questions, um, you've answered aspects of them. So I'll read it. And if you have anything else to add, we'll go. Um, so. Thanks for the presentation. Many of the MPAs have different zones in them under different levels of protection from buffer zones to areas under strict protection. Do you expect to include this division of zones in the future? So right now we have zone information and we're specifically sourcing that zone details from MP Atlas because we want to use that. We know that they have a very great methodology they follow. Um, it's independently assessed. So as far as if there are zones um, verified by them, that information is available now. If you're speaking to zones coming from some other assessments, um, we'd love to explore that. But for now, just to keep it simple and knowing the great quality of work they've done and the fact that their evaluation of the top 100 MPAs actually covers 89% of global marine protected areas implemented. We felt that gets a very great coverage. Um, so that's the detail we have now. So you will see some zoning, such as the Panama example I showed where they had the two zones of one fully, one highly. Um, that information is available now. Um, but we, if there's other assessments or other methodologies we should consider, again, we'd love to kind of discuss that. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see. Does the tool link back to the legislation, regulation, or laws that protect each polygon? Not directly, but indirectly. So if you're specifically talking about fishing protection levels, so once we have the information uh, layered in very soon from protected seas, what we recommend is we don't want to replicate what uh, protected seas have done. They've been doing it for years. They're experts in it. Their tool is amazing. 
So what we want to do is just at a high level kind of show that information alongside all these other great data sets. But if someone wants to dig deeper into the actual legislation, we would ask them to branch off to um, Protect the Seas Navigator. And we do have links that take you there. We want to, over time, make this even more seamless integration. So we might consider having links directly from a visualized MPA where you can click on it and pick where to go. But for now, you kind of link from our either from our about page or data partners from the knowledge hub, or there are in the information panels links to the data partners. So we would ask you to go to Protect the Seas because they have all that information curated, validated, and done great work there. Thank you. Um, let's see, another question. How are seasonal or full fishery closures incorporated into the percentage since a particular area may be closed for one fishery but not for another? So again, it's, I think it's similar to a question earlier. Um, I, don't, I don't believe they're um, in the calculations at the moment as far as coverage, because the coverage is really looking at uh, MPAs and OSMs specifically. Um, the level of protection information likely will be available in Protect Seas Navigator, but I would need to confirm that. Um, so kind of the seasonal components, I think I need to do a little digging on that just to make sure how that's actually captured in some of the underlying data that we're consuming. But directly here, um, I don't believe we have any seasonal components. It's just more locations of MPAs and OCMs. And then their level of protection is based on that assessment from uh, Protect the Seas for fishing protection level and from MP Atlas for overall protection levels. Thank you. Um, another question, which you sort of touched on, but I'll, I'll ask it. Do you store all of your own data, collected data, or scrape it from the source on each request? Uh, we store it. So our partners will, either through APIs or um, other data feed mechanisms, will send their information to us. And then we capture the information and apply our methodology where needed in order to capture the details that we show on our um, site. OK, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm going through for any I've missed in the right of the Q&A. Uh, oh, okay. Taking off my social science hat and putting on my marine ecologist hat now, the ocean is a 3D space. Does the tracker account for vertical protection in the ocean? That is a great question. And I don't know, I would have to look at the MPA guide methodology and the um, protected sea and MPA guide methodology, which also is partnered with MP Atlas, how their methodology for assigning zoning for protection levels works when it's that, that type of zoning. Um, I can look into that and get back to you. Similar on the protected seas, when they're looking at a level of fishing protection, um, I would have to verify the details of the methodology. I don't want to speak to it right now and misstate something, but I can absolutely find that information. And um, if we have the contact info for whoever asked that, I can share that. And we'll also explain that on our site as well. Okay, yes, absolutely. Um, you, I'll send you uh, information on, on who asked what questions. Sure. And well, that's so. a great question, an important thing that we should cover. Okay, um, there was a question, is this data available for download such as shapefiles or KMZ? Currently is not. Um, it is something the backlog around having the ability to log in, add your own information, extract information, um, just the scope of what we're trying to do now. We're trying to prioritize what's most important in order to get this platform up and running, both on the marine and terrestrial side. So for now, um, it is not. But all of our information we're sourcing are available from our various partner sites. So depending on what information you're trying to get to, um, it might be downloadable directly from either Protected Planet, Protected Seas, MP Atlas. Thank you. Um going in a very different direction. Um, this might seem like a deeply academic question about cartography, but I'm curious about why SkyTruth would use the Mercator projection for a product that is centered around the idea of protected and conserved areas. It would seem like it would make more sense to use an equal area projection, such as the Equal Earth, Lambert Cylindrical, or Gall Peters. Is there functionality to avoid all the projection issues and just project the tracker onto a globe? That is a great question and one that I absolutely have to go back to the team for a little more clarity around um, why we landed on the um, approach we did. Um, so I, I I don't feel positioned to answer that right now, but that's a great question. And um, I can absolutely find out and ask the team uh, their perspective and come back to you. Okay, great. Thank you. That was a good test. Uh, <laughs> yes. 
Uh, let's see, a couple other questions. Um, we protect glacial moraine. I noticed that is not included in your habitats that are protected in the ocean. Um, why not? Uh, it's just more of the subset of habitats we looked at. Um, there was our source of information for habitats uh, we were looking at. Um, these were the ones they were highlighting. So we kind of focus it on that from the ocean data viewer, um, what habitats they've listed out. If there's more habitats we should include, we can absolutely add those in and calculate as well. Uh, again, we were just trying to find a way to draw a line in the sand to limit the scope of what we were initially rolling out so that we'd have the time, the resources to deliver it, but also it would be robust enough to be impactful and help to inform people and drive conversations and decisions. But um, if that's a habitat that should be included, um, we would definitely consider it. Okay. All right, thank you, Jason. Um, let me just scan the chat for any questions we've missed. I think we've got everything from the Q&A right now. Um, there was a comment. Um, it would be interesting to show how countries are progressing and comparing them uh, for the Mediterranean to show how different countries are moving on the 30 by 30 commitments over time, but also to show protected areas on the high seas. Um, for example, fisheries restricted areas through the RFMO for the MED. Um, I don't see the fisheries restricted areas in the MED in your tool at the moment. Thank you. So just a comment. But, um, yeah, and that's a great comment, something that we're considering. So right now we focus on MPAs and OECMs because those are the two mechanisms are specifically called out on target three as ways to achieve the goal. So there's a lot of other potential protections that could be shown um, that are of value. It's just right now we were just focusing on what was explicitly kind of called out on target three. As far as the tracking over time, you can look at countries individually and you can see their trend. But you're right, right now we didn't have a side by side where you can see kind of change um, that timeline change or that um, temporal change and see if certain countries are ramping up versus maybe some invested early and have not changed over the last 10 years. Um, but if you wanted to do comparisons, you could just go through and look at individual countries at the moment and kind of look at how it's changed over the last 10 years. Okay, thank you. Um, just another comment, um, more functionality uh, desired. Uh, it would be cool if you could click on the various resources and that would provide more information. For example, clicking on a particular salt marsh area. And no, that's a great idea. Uh, again, it was a balancing between the various different things that we were trying to deliver and that more uh, interactive on the map, like filtering and clicking and being a link. Those are things we absolutely want to do to really improve the user experience. But we emphasize first getting the foundation elements in place, the correct data in place, uh, the visuals, the, cape, the uh, indicators. But that user experience component, um, something as we get partners in place with active use cases that you know want specific functionality that really help to uh, simplify their processes, we can definitely start to incorporate those. But yeah, that's great ideas and one that we actually definitely have on our backlog. Just haven't prioritized it high enough yet. Thank you, Jason. Um, I did find one question we haven't addressed. Can we change the transparency on the various layers? I think you can resort the order of them, but I think a lot of that kind of, again, UX, user experience type of components haven't been completely fine tuned yet. You know, we feel that Dev Team did a great job of designing something that's very uh, aesthetically pleasing, but there are gonna be some tweaks we can make and that could be one that we'd explore. But right now, I don't believe you can and I would have to play with it. Um, I don't think you can fine tune that too much. There's a little controls around it. Um, and if you go down to the right-hand corner, if you're actually on the platform in the legend, you'll can see some controls you can do around opacity and others. Um, so you might be able to get to what you're trying to achieve, but it depends on specifically what they want to accomplish. Uh, let's see a couple more. Um, Elva, hydrothermal vending, okay. Yes, Elva asked, um, are you using, it's, we got something similar. Okay, are you using seafloor layers to define the percentage of conservation of seamounts, ridges, deep sea corals, canyons? And there's an interest in hydrothermal vents. Um, we aren't, we're using uh, information we sourced from Ocean Data Viewer for the location of seamounts. So we're dependent on um, the assessments that these other data partners have done in order to identify the location of the various habitats, like Global Mangrove Watch for uh, mangrove locations. So it's really based on um, those data sets. 
off the top of my head, I'm not sure what methodology they use to identify the locations. Um, so it could be indirectly um, based on that, but I would have to take this offline and go look and I can find an answer to that question. Thank, thank you. Um, let's see. And we sort of got at this before, but I'll, I'll ask it again. Is there a time series variable angle here? Uh, for example, can we go back in time to see how protection is involved and where? So the only way that you can do that now, you can do it at the global, regional, and um, country by country level. And it's in the dashboard. It's more, it's based on information reported into Protected Planet and what the coverage was for each of those applicable, depending on what um, global perspective or what um, geographical perspective you selected. It's going to show a historical trend of what was reported in. Um, over time. So you can see how that has changed. And that's what we're using right now to extrapolate forward to say at that exact same rate of change, where will we land by 2030? Ideally, and we would love to get here, if people start to publish and share plans of real plans for implementation into the future, rather than using that historical what's been reported and extrapolating forward, we'd love to actually integrate those plans. But that's all dependent on people making that available and publishing it and sharing it. Um, but now, right now, it's just that histogram. If you look at the dashboard in the upper left, you can see that historical trend. Okay, fantastic. So, um, one another question. Okay, is it possible to search by the name of a protected area? Right now, no. Um, all the searching is based on either glo at the global level, regions, or at the country level. Uh, that's something we'd explore to take further. Um, but right now, based on this being a global data set and really trying to keep it at a higher level at a country or above for tracking progress. And the goal really is, is monitoring progress at country, region, global towards achieving 30 by 30 goals. We didn't really want to take it further down. You can see what um, MPAs and OECMs exist within those different um, countries, but we haven't given the ability to kind of focus quickly down to that more granular detail. But that's something that we could explore in the future as use cases come up and um, there's a, a, a goal to include, or I'm sorry, include that. So the ability to search for a marine protected area. That's where we'd want, if you really went to that detailed of information, we'd point you to our partners. Like if you want to understand protection levels and assessments, go to MP Atlas and look for that specific MPA. And then you can really look at the details or go to uh, protected planet if you understand what's been reported around that. Uh, for us, we're looking to really more aggregate information at a higher level to give uh, easier way to understand progress towards 30 by 30. Okay, thank you. Um, another question that came in, I went, this will be our last one. Um, uh, who do you expect to be the main users of the tool? Or who are you finding to be the, the main users of the tool? Yeah, I think our, our intended users for the tool, and so far we've found that civil society advocacy organizations have been quite engaged with this tool. Um, this is a publicly available tool, so we're eager for conservation practitioners to really engage with this tool as a starting point to learning more about 30 by 30. Um, and certainly this is also a great starting point for governments. We have engaged several governments as well as the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People, um, and this is available as a resource for government and, and also the agencies that are within those governments. Okay. Um, thank you so much, guys. Um, Michelle and Jason, this was fantastic. Um, obviously, huge interest in the tool. And um, what's there already is wonderful ideas for um, things to add in the future. Um, we really, really appreciate you guys coming on presenting this today and answering a lot of questions. Um, I'd also like to give a, a shout out to Shyla and Eric from SkyTruth uh, in the background, answering lots of questions and helping me get organized. And I'd also like to uh, thank all of the attendees um, for the active participation in the chat with a special shout out to um, the folks from a Protected Planet and MPA Atlas. Um, I know Deidre, Beth, and Jennifer were answering questions, and um, I think there were a few others that I'll, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm not naming, but um, we appreciate everyone's active participation, and uh, it was really fun to watch. There um, were some requests for the information from the chat, um, so if you are interested, I'll, I'll do sort of a... Um, a summary of the the public information there, um, and you can you can 
get it from me if you email me at sarah at octogroup.org. Um, I'll make that available. Um, but thank you all. Um, thank you so much to um, everyone from SkyTruth for all this work and for being willing to present today. And thank you to everyone who attended for your participation and interest. Uh, we hope to see you on future webinars. So hope you have a good day. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Really appreciate it.